One of the immortal questions we came to in this series on risk is do we choose risk or does risk choose us? I realize that while some live evil Knievel style risking life and limb kind of lives, others don't. Most of us don't choose dramatic risk, but have risk choosing us each day. Some are born into it, thrust into it, live it every day. They leave the house. Any person of color in a white society, any woman, any LGB or trans person, those who live lives that question the standard paradigms of society, those who have trauma, those who walk carefully in the world risk without choosing risk. We often elevate those who take extraordinary risk, but might do well to acknowledge that for many of us, just getting up, moving through the day is extraordinary. You might feel like that yourself. I think in some way we all do. That is why those who choose risk seem so alien sometimes. Choosing risk and risk choosing us divides us. So except it, it, instead of doing that, I think there is a Lenten theme that unites us that I chose to speak on today, and that is temptation. I say Lenten because there is no Lent no 40 days leading up to Easter without temptation, specifically the period in the biblical story of reflection when Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days and is tempted there. Lent is a time of reflection that tempts us to see who we are and its response. It's a kind of risk that chooses all of us. Acted upon some temptations will lead us into risks we did not intend. Left alone, they are inner challenges to do the right thing. Now, if we were Calvinists, which we are not, we might think temptations are all kinds of sins that pull us further from faith. I think the opposite. I think every temptation is a risk that chooses us and calls us into a deeper faith. In the wilderness myth from today's reading, Jesus is, te is tempted by the devil. I know you love that word, the devil. <laughs> Remember, it's all metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> the temptations are the portal to the world of doing what is right. It's the crucible in which Jesus is refined so that he can have an active ministry in the world and choose the risks that he must choose rather than have them choose him. That same crucible is in every myth you've ever writ read. The Buddha, Odysseus, and any other character worth his or her salt. Temptations will appear to drive the hero off course, but the hero who triumphs over them thrives in his or her life. Jesus is not exempt and neither are we. So Jesus is tempted by a fallen angel or a failed angel, if you like that word better. Tempted literally means to try or touch or test. Deep in this word is a sense that we must act out some things to discover who we are in relation to them. Jesus in the wilderness is tempted to easy solutions to his physical hunger. I say the story is talking about spiritual hunger and reminds us that there are no easy answers to deep spiritual questions. He is tempted to power, I say a false power over others, a separation from the suffering of others. He is tempted to relevance, the temptation to be spectacular, to be more than he really is. For Jesus, no temptation could steer him off course. For the hero, no temptation can steer one off course. But the temptations themselves are the inner journey, the challenges to integrity and to poise and spiritual strength. 
Now, I decided instead of doing a big theological dissertation on this story, I would talk to you about my own temptations, for which you will thank me later. I scratched my well-thought-out sermon on the wilderness narrative <laughs> and replaced it with a reflection of what tempts me in hope that you might see inside yourself while staring into the abyss of my temptations. I mean, what is good preaching if from time to time it's not opening the heart of the preacher so that others can see in and maybe see their reflection? So I came up with this list of things I am tempted to. I want to share it with you now. The first is that I am tempted to think and act like I am younger than I really am. I am 51 and I say I feel like a 32 year old with something wrong with him. <laughs> this temptation makes me think I can do more than I can, go longer, work harder, be something I am not. It's useful sometimes, but it catches up to me. Anybody here know that temptation? Second, I'm tempted to think this whole existence is just inside someone's dream. It's all an illusion. Sort of Tibetan Buddhist style, where my autonomy is illusory. This has endless possibilities and almost no responsibilities. It ties to my dread that maybe I don't really have free will at all. It's a temptation not only to lose myself in philosophy, but to spiral toward the idea that this all matters very little. That if we are in another's dream and it's all illusion, what's the difference? At the end of this list, I just wrote the word help. <laughs> Third, I'm tempted by the idea that I can think my way into serenity. <laughs> Which I know, having said that, after describing an existential spiral of nihilism is a strange thing to hear. <laughs> but I'm tempted to think that I can think my way into just about anything. Serenity being one of them, fully knowing that serenity probably has little to do with thinking, but rather presence and awareness. Fourth, and related to number three, I am tempted by the notion that I can think my way back into shape or into a better golf swing or whatever. As a child, I had this fantasy that I would go and sit down at the piano and play a beautiful piece with no training and no practice. <laughs> I know I was a little bit odd in that, but I'm tempted by this thought of perfection without effort, competence without practice, skills without study. Fifth, I'm tempted by the thought that just one TED Talk or one more publication will bring riches and fame. My temptation to spectacle meets Jesus on the parapet over the temple with that fallen angel. I think you and I, we might share this temptation because I watch your Facebook feeds. <laughs> There's something obscene about social media. and It's a kind of exhibitionism where we are all looking for attention with the hope that we are seen, that we are somehow made famous, that we are relevant or at minimum noticed. Sixth, I'm tempted to think that if I'm holy enough, I will know God. Ignoring all the classic reading that says meeting God's, God means, means serious annihilation, the temptation is the idea of holiness without effort. There is a theme here, by the way. <laughs> that without prayer or without meditation or spiritual practice, I can achieve some holy state of mind and meet God once and for all. This is being tempted by the illusion of holiness, the idea that meeting God is a good thing. Coming down to earth, I heard Annie Lamott, the popular writer, 
call God, G-O-D, the gift of desperation. (laughs) The truth is somewhere between mindfulness and becoming aware of the holy through moments of desperation, really. We cannot formulate or manufacture the spiritual encounter. But we must become aware not only of our own desperation, but aware of the moment we exist in. Seventh, I'm tempted by just about any kind of cheesecake. (laughs) Eight, (laughs) I'm tempted by the idea that most of life is mundane. This is the temptation to forget that God's first words to Moses, one of the three central figures in the Bible, were to speak to him in the desert saying, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. A great lesson that the mundane is always sacred, and the sacred is usually mundane. But looking for sacredness in holy places usually leaves us flat, while finding it in mundane places is usually the most exhilarating moment in life. Nine, I'm tempted by the idea that I'm going to be okay after my parents die. Here's another illusion of autonomy. The truth is somewhere between the relativity of okay and knowing nothing and no one is autonomous. And finally, I'm tempted by the idea that in old age I can slip away and no one will notice. (laughs) I don't exactly know why this is. I think it has something to do with reading the National Geographic as a child about Hindu ideals where the eldest adult doesn't retire to the golf course but relinquishes everything he has earned for a begging ball and wanders out into the wilderness once and for all. That just seemed so appealing to me. No burden on family, no attachments, no possessions. The fantasy is tempting some days to just disappear, but the opposite is probably true. No one gets out of here easily. And if life means anything, someone will mourn and remember me and I just might not be an incredible burden on my children. The one thing I hope is I'm not only remembered for saying I am tempted by any kind of cheesecake. Now, my list could probably go on, and it probably should include some daily things that aren't good for me or those gnawing realities of social and personal relevance. But the exercise I set out for myself was to dig a little deeper. Being tempted is not the dive into sin, as Calvin might have put it, but rather the risk of temptation is to know who we are spiritually a little better. It's a way of defining the work we have to do in the wilderness of our spiritual lives. It's a way of formulating a path of spiritual discipline that confronts our spiritual neglect or nihilism or discontent. It's a way of allowing the risk of temptation to teach us something about ourselves. You see, temptations for me are signposts that point to the vulnerable parts of our inner lives. They demand answers from deep within. They require genuine confrontation from the strongest parts of who we are. These signposts show paths to discipline and can be seen as encouragement to growth, not symbols of our sinful nature, as our Calvinist neighbors might think. And I know that as I explore these temptations, this community and friends and family are ready to meet the risks of these challenges with me. Your temptations won't go away. They come again and again. But in answer to each temptation is deeper, more genuine power that says we can create disciplines of the heart that confront the greatest risks of life 
those that challenge us to grow and to change. And the truth is that even when it, all this is true and you think, am I in someone else's dream or you're tempted to illusions of escape or you're spiraling in thoughts and feelings of your own making and then temptations are serious and hard and back-breaking spiritual work that takes time and energy, always, 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 the rescue is someone will offer you a piece of cheesecake and you should take it and then get back to your disciplined life. Go easy on yourself, but hold yourself accountable to the deeper parts of the spirit, the parts that are patient and wait for you to arrive, the parts that this community can help you with, to help you navigate through the spiritual wilderness. So I recommend you make a list of your temptations sometime today or this week. Start with the basics that tug at you and then work your way toward those existential temptations and see what kind of responses you have. You can do this. It's good for your soul because without such risks, we are never free. Without such risks of the heart, we are never whole. So thank you for hearing my list today. And you're welcome for not having to listen to a long theological dissertation on the wilderness. I hope my list found resonance in you today. I love you. Amen. And may God bless you all your days.